Good Let's evening, everybody. It's great to see everyone that has joined us this evening, mm -hmm. again this week. And if this is your first time joining us and you're on Facebook Live, we want to welcome you. We're glad you're here. My name is Erica Azak, and along with my co-host, Captain Sheldon Bungie, we're going to guide you through the next four weeks of our book study on Commissioner Phil Needham's book, Christ at the Door, Biblical Keys to Our Salvationist Future. Mm -hmm. We want to begin today's session by acknowledging that wherever we are Zooming in from, the land on which we gather is not our own. For me, I'm Zooming in tonight from St. John's Newfoundland in Labrador, and I respectfully acknowledge the land on which I gather is the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose culture has now been erased forever. I also acknowledge the island of Ukumagok as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq, and we acknowledge Labrador as the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Innu of Natasinan, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, and the Inuit of Nunatagavut. We recognize all first peoples who were here before us, those who live with us now and the seven generations to come. As first peoples have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Over this 12 week journey, we've been joined by our territorial leaders. We wanna take a moment to welcome Commissioners Floyd and Tracy Tidd and Colonels Edward and Shelley Hill. Each week, our territorial leaders joined us. Also, each week we're joined by a special guest or an amazing group of panelists. Sometimes, like they are tonight, they come to us from around the world. Salvationists and friends who will help us go a little deeper on the concepts discussed in Commissioner Phil Needham's book. Now it's time for us to introduce the special guests that we have with us tonight. We want to introduce to you, and some of you probably know them, if not in real life, by reputation, Colonels Ian and Wendy. They're Canadian by birth, and they're global citizens by choice. Their service in Canada, Central Africa, and Southeast Asia reflect their commitment to the global body of Christ. They were commissioned as Heralds of Hope in 1983, the Swans have followed the leading of God throughout their ministry, no matter where it took them, and it has taken them far and wide. Colonel Ian and Wendy are the territorial leaders of the Zambia Territory, and Colonel Dr. Wendy Swan also serves as the Secretary of the International Theological Council. What a privilege it is for us to hear from them this evening. We want to let you know that tonight will look a little bit different from any of the first eight weeks. Due to the instability of the internet in Zambia, we have pre-recorded this video. And so we invite you to simply sit back and observe the next 30 minutes or so as you listen to this wonderful interview with these two fantastic officers and wonderful representatives of the Canada and Bermuda Territory. Enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the video. Okay, well, Welcome, yes. Ian and Wendy. Uh, we are so thankful that you would uh, give us some of your time to answer these questions for us and to help us uh, as we uh, begin this third section of our book study together here in the Canada and Bermuda Territory. I wonder if you could just simply start by telling us a little bit about your office, officership journey. Uh, how long have you been officers and where have you served? Um, I'll, I'll start with myself. I was commissioned in 1983 out of Toronto as a Herald of Hope. Um, probably in year five, that's when Ian and I married. Uh, I had been a Corps officer up to that point. We then went overseas and I'll let Ian speak a little bit about the international journey. Uh, but I've been an officer now, hard to believe, 37 years. Yeah, uh, Wendy uh, joined officership Prior to myself, I went in 1982 to Kenya on a Salvationist lay contract to teach at the Secondary School for the Blind and then be headmaster for a nomadic school on the Ethiopian border. Returning to Canada and going to training college, uh, we met again after serving together in our home corps of Victoria. 
and upon the completion of my training, uh, married and began to make our journey towards where we thought we were going, Tanzania. That appointment eventually evolved into a seven year appointment in Zambia, our present territory of service, where we were extension training officers in the new in-service program for a developing capacity and skills from national officers at administrative and operational levels. The conclusion of seven years, IHQ asked us to go to Hong Kong, where uh, we served at the training college uh, jointly for seven years. And at the end of that period, I was then made the supervisor for Hong Kong Salvation Army Schools, and Wendy was training principal. Conclusion of a third term, nine years, we returned to Canada, uh, where we served both at the training college when it relocated to Winnipeg and at Booth University, uh, finally becoming full-time at Booth University and completing eight years of service in Canada. We thought we might retire there, but IHQ called us to return um, to Hong Kong and work on the China development agenda. And after six years of service, asked us again to move back to Zambia. So we did at one point say to IHQ, there are more than three countries in the world because we went Canada, Zambia, Hong Kong, Canada, Hong Kong, Zambia. But we have been blessed in all three appointments and are enjoying the possibilities and responsibilities we have. So at this point in our study, we are really focusing on discipleship. Uh, we've talked a little bit about discipleship uh, from an internal perspective, looking at ourselves. We've talked about how we can make our core more missional focused. And now we are moving into the community to make sure that we are focusing on how we can disciple others. Given your vast uh, international experience, how would you say that uh, discipleship might look different in the various places in which you have served? Hmm, interesting question. I think I'd begin with the foundation that every every culture would would say that they're following certainly the New Testament understanding of discipleship. I think it's about the expression of discipleship that perhaps might look different. Um, in certain cultures, individuals are perhaps we might term more reserved or conservative, um, very respectful, perhaps even leaning to the liturgical in their worship and their and their Bible study. Other cultures have very free expressions, uh, very demonstrative. Um, and certainly I think that's something that has impacted myself. Uh, in Asia, individuals in, in Bible study is really where the sharing happens, uh, sharing of personal story, sharing of, of personal growth and struggles. Uh, in the African context, certainly in Zambia, and Malawi where we've been. Um, people speak very openly about what's going right and what's going wrong. Uh, there's little left to the imagination, very open discussion. Uh, regardless of whether issues are considered traditionally, we don't talk about that. We find that the younger generations are more than prepared to talk about issues that are important to them and how that relates to their spiritual life. I, I would add to that in the sense that uh, commonality shared across the three territories, as well as uh, territories and other zones where we've been consulting or teaching, is the relationship one. While there is emphasis on public meetings and proclamation, it seems that the discipleship, the winning of new converts and the deepening of disciples happens in a one-to-one -one or small group. Mm -hmm. I think a significant difference, I would say, between Asia and in particular our China experience, where Christians are less than 1% of the population, a discipleship conversation begins re rooted in a kind of faith conversation. Which of the five major streams do you belong to? Or oh, you're a Christian, and then leads more to what is your particular expression. China, China would say that they are a first century New Testament church in that there are no denominations. And so there's a common language we speak among Christians because we are in a minority. Serving now in a country which proclaims itself to be a Christian nation is a completely different experience. There is an openness from everyone. Uh, people at the grocery store, at the gas station, once they see your uniform, they go, oh, Salvation Army, we know you, your hospital, your school, we went to your church. 
And so the intro is much easier. As Wendy is saying, the subtlety to some conversations it take you three years uh, building relationship before you could actually talk about faith. Here in Zambia, no, anyone on the street. Um, mm -hmm. Canada, again, there are some boundaries, uh, but we found in new communities where we were part of uh, new housing. Uh, again, the friendship across fences, uh, meeting people at the corner when you're walking your dog, led to the building of relationship which could lead to deeper conversations. The thing about hosting is I can get lost in this story. Just an extension Sorry, that's okay. to the. That's, that's <laughs> Just fine. An extension. Ask, ask us some questions. I'll edit it all out eventually, I'm I think, sure. I, I would add one more. Can I add one more piece to that, that discipleship sure. piece? Um, in our international experience, both in the African context as well as the Asian Chinese context, both are both are based on relationship, as Ian has mentioned, but both are based on extended community. Mm -hmm. They are community based. In other words, often we read in literature, I exist because we are. <laughs> and so there, there's very much, for us, there was, it was a similarity and a fluidity almost moving in between these cultures. While there were distinctives, uh, the concept of discipleship and what it means to belong, which is, which is such a key component of Christian faith, I believe, uh, it became very easy for us um, and almost a, just a natural expression of, of course, we're in this together. What do you think? And that leads to conversation. And I think you would find parallels perhaps in your experience in northern communities. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't exist as a single, you exist as a unit. And uh, conversations need to happen in a collaborative, uh, consultative way. And so there, there is a sense where while individuals may mature, there's a maturing process across the entire group. And that, that's ex very exciting to be part of too. And because of that communal dimension, individuals are accountable to a community and equally are supported by a community as they grow in their faith and they work through issues and, and challenges along the way. So as an extension of that, you shared about some of the similarities and differences from Zambia to Hong Kong. Our, our next question leads us into, if we're to consider the Salvation Army in, the, in North America and the Canada Bermuda Territory, what do you think we could learn from our international brothers and sisters? Let me start off, I, I think from Zambia expression, and there are obviously parallels across the other 15 territories of Salvation Army work in Africa, but I think over and over again, um, we are struck by the great sense of joy, even in the midst of hardship. We just spent the last week with our home corps, uh, which we joined 30 years ago uh, before our children were born and our children were dedicated. But 30 years last weekend, we finally celebrated the completion of the core hall and its painting. Well, with a roof. And a roof. <laughs> and people danced. The, the yeah. sense of expression. Um, the meeting went on. Of course it went on because people just kept celebrating. And so that real physical expression of worship and commitment as disciples and the fact that while we rejoiced about the hall uh, over and over again throughout the gathering it was and so community can come in and meet Christ and move along their discipleship journey. And equally so the, the actual building of the hall represented a going out into community. I, I would say both in the Zambi experience as well as the Hong Kong, the Christian life is about community. I think one of the things that I have often been challenged by having been, well, born and grown up in the West is that because we put such an emphasis on individuality and privacy, uh, it, it really is all, it is about me and I may or may not choose to share. What I continue to learn in this international life uh, from others is that because you do live in community, 
you should be sharing. You should be seeking out the one who is different than you because there's richness there. Uh, there's discovery there. Um, we both find it absolutely, well, normal for us to engage with somebody we absolutely don't know in any way. You engage with the gas attendant, you engage with the shop lady, you greet someone because it's such a large part of community. Um, my Canadian experience, while limited over you know the last 30 some years, would say that we, we tend to, um, we let people be private and we don't want to interfere. When in fact, I think, I think there is a real genuine desire to please see me, <laughs> um, please hear me, please smile as you greet me, um, because that's the beginning of conversation and conversation leads to what does it mean to be a neighbor and as, the, as those things happen, then it, it naturally, I think, leads to a conversation about faith. What are the things that are really important to you? Why did you decide or act the way you did? Th those are all faith questions. I think similarly with our, our work in Hong Kong and particularly mainland China, where relationships have been strained. Now, some of that is because of the last 40 years of political environment uh, where deliberate isolation was created. But I think pastors in China across denominational lines would say one of the reasons Christianity is growing so quickly, one of the reasons discipleship is working so rapidly in China is because people are longing to be engaged with other people. Uh, we found even in Winnipeg, 30% uh, of our home core in Winnipeg were from mainland China. They were studying at the university. And we, we did a quick survey. Uh, we asked, why, why do you come? Um, almost 90% said it's because we are warmly welcomed. Our hands are, are, are greeted and we're given a hug. Now in China, the, the church is growing so rapidly that many of them have to have multiple services. You know, we're talking 3,000, 5,000 people. Uh, and when you ask why, it's because they're coming to a safe place. They're coming to a place where they can talk about their families openly and they're supported and they feel there's a community of people who are holding an ideal. They're looking towards a transformation. And uh, I would say for me, discipleship becomes more of that creating a family relationship that leads to transformation, not only for the individual, but the family and the community they work in. Excellent. That, that talks that, that directly that's into that's uh, my next question. Uh, you know, Mr. Needham really lays it on the line here and says, you know, we don't need to leave discipleship to the pros. We don't need to always be signing up for discipleship classes. Um, the best way perhaps to do discipleship is together with other people, with other believers in relationship, as you've just highlighted so well. Uh, I wonder how we can perhaps encourage our church congregations, our core here in the Canada and Bermuda Territory specifically, um, how can we encourage them to rethink this idea that discipleship can only happen from the core officers, that the that the leaders mm -hmm. are the only ones that can teach those discipleship classes? How, how can we encourage that relationship building uh, amongst our people in our communities? Let me start off just giving you two examples that have happened in the last two months. Um, budgets are always a, a struggle for any faith community, uh, but COVID has put more pressure upon that. So we were sitting in a territorial management board talking about our mission and evangelism strategies and some of our lack of cash flow. And one brave soul in the room put up their hand and they said, are we saying if there's no budget, there's no mission? And that started off a very delightful conversation where we said, no, if we got out of this room and went and stood at the bus stop, mission could happen. As long as we're prepared to say hello to somebody, introduce ourselves and begin to explain our relationship with Christ. The second conversation I had two weeks ago, um, there's a particularly large core building and the stress of that budget plan and business plan is creating fractions and friction in the core. And so at one point in the meeting, I stopped the core officer who was very passionate about building this thing. I asked him, did Jesus ever build anything? And there was silence in the room as though, you know, I had said the wrong thing until finally he said, 
No, he just walked from village to village. And I said, yes, and he managed to, you know, reach the whole world. What I'm trying to say is I think there's times where we have to challenge our norms. I know we can't evangelize till we have a building. We can't send out a team. Um, goodness sake, never send junior soldiers to talk about anybody at school. Uh, last November in the Zono conference, I was sharing that uh, to another territorial leader about our Africa strategy. And he said, you know, I was challenged most by my eight-year-old son. He came uh, home from school and he said, I want, to, uh, I want to be baptized. And he said, why? He said, well, because my friend said I needed to, to know Jesus. And that started a conversation around, here's eight-year-olds challenging each other about their faith. Are we doing enough to say, you know, that junior members are just as well equipped as senior professionals to talk to someone and say, Jesus loves you, do you know him? I, I think for me, it's, it's a very basic thing in that if I call myself a disciple, uh, I'm, I'm literally sharing my story of what it means for me to follow Jesus. It's not about being perfect. It's not about having arrived. It's certainly not about having all the answers. In fact, I am far more intrigued by people who ask questions <laughs> uh, because it, it just demonstrates that they're, they're searching or they're thinking about it. Um, and, and those simple principles make it for me, even today, make, make it easy to be a disciple of Jesus in that I haven't got it all together. I've had a series of experiences, but none of that matters unless I'm connected to Christ. And so I, I think there is a sense in which we have somehow professionalized what it means to, instead of looking at the gift of evangelism, i.e. somebody who just naturally talks <laughs> can talk about <laughs> their relationship with Christ, we've somehow said, you know, okay, you're, you're going to have an appointment or we've formalized it so much that we've, we've forgotten that it, it really is a growing experience for us as well. Um, and it, it starts exactly where you are. It's not about taking, as you've said, formal courses or degrees or a whole mess of training, as helpful as that can be. But it just starts with you and me. But I think as was demonstrated in the early army, um, the testimony of new believers, no, mm -hmm. new converts. And we have been in territories and worked with corps officers who, you almost have to be a saint, you know, to be made a soldier. Where in the earlier days, because people were so excited that their sins were forgiven and they felt this overwhelming love of God's mercy, they couldn't be stopped from telling other people. Mm -hmm. And I see that repeatedly in the New Testament. Jesus tells someone, don't tell anyone. Well, what's the first thing they do? They run down the road and they tell everybody. <laughs> and so discipleship happens so organically out of that excitement. Um, some of that can tend to be lost along the way if we're not careful. Now, I'm also not saying, and I know that Colonel Wendy would agree with, it helps people in, to reduce anxiety and stress, to give them certain techniques and approaches. But I think the earliest opportunity for a convert to simply go and tell someone, and I remember even in our core in Winnipeg, that was one of the expectations of new converts. We would say, now this week, Go and talk to somebody about what you've just experienced and come back and tell us. And some were very afraid at first, but when they came back, you know, they, we didn't talk to one person, we talked to 10. That's the excitement of discipleship. Thank you. This has been incredibly encouraging already. <laughs> I feel like I don't want to get to the last question, but we do have oh, you, can make up, you can make up another one. <laughs> Well, we do we do have another one that we might uh, sneak in there at the end, but I'm going to share a quote from Needham's book from chapter nine, which is the chapter we're studying this week. And this is what he says. He says, Jesus invites our entire core to live in the world so convincingly as his disciples that some people want to be like us. Some will even start acting like us until they see Jesus and embrace him as Lord. So in your experience, have you seen this as reality in your ministry? Do people need to be saved to be able to 
to serve as, as Christ did? Very interesting question. I, uh, well, going back to the China experience, if that was the case, I don't think you would see many people serving. Um, we've lived most of our life as minorities. <laughs> and so there is a sense in which, um, yeah, you, you need partners, you need each other. And as Ian has already mentioned, one of the greatest pieces is about belonging. We, we all want to belong, whether it's a circle of friends, it's a family. It's a, and I think, I think that's one of the greatest gifts that Christianity and a Christian community can give to the larger neighborhood and community is that sense in which all are welcome, you know, come and spend time with us. Um, we, we used to do something in Hong Kong, probably, well, we lived there 15 years altogether. But we would just simply invite anybody who was linked in any way to Canada to come and celebrate Thanksgiving. Uh, and it was, uh, what was it, like buffet, everybody brought something kind of thing. But there was always a turkey, somebody managed to get uh, poultry. Half the time we didn't even know who came. So from year to year there'd be anywhere from 40 to 60 people, but they'd all show up and we'd use the training college um, and tables and chairs and all that. Anyway, you'd have a huge group. At the end of those kinds of, uh, kinds of days, people would say to us, hey, I can't believe I'm in the Salvation Army. And you guys, I had a blast today. Um, <laughs> it, it was so much fun. They, they just had no concept. Their assumption and their assumption ideas of what they thought Christians were <laughs> or what people did in church or what people said or didn't say, um, it just broke down all those barriers just by being together. And I, I think those, those were in the sense that you would say, well, hey, if you, if you ever wanna join us for a Sunday service, you might be surprised or you continue to build relationship. I think one of the marks, certainly of the early army and of many Salvationists I know around the world is, is the mark of celebration and joy. I mean, when I read the New Testament, Jesus was at every party known. <laughs> And, and he was hanging out with people that somehow didn't necessarily fit into other social groups. But he made, he made life so attractive. You know, he didn't, he didn't compromise, but he made life so attractive um, that people really did want to spend time with him. How, how do we as Salvationists do that in our different contexts and neighborhoods? Like who's throwing the block party? Who's knocking on the door to say, hi, how are you doing? It's, it's a very simple thing, um, but it, it, it is about that reaching out. And I think that's really what makes the Christian faith uh, attractive. That I, I'm attracted to people who, uh, who are enjoying life, regardless of the challenges and the struggles they might be walking in. I, I think sometimes there's, there's a tendency in some fellowships to feel the disengagement is an act of deeper discipleship or even to use the word holiness. Whereas holiness is actually engagement in community, as Wendy is saying. How do we bring the marginalized into deeper fellowship? How do we show that it's exciting and joyful to have this relationship? I would also add to that, that I believe that uh, the world around us, the community, the people we work with are also watching us carefully to see if there's integrity. Mm -hmm. In other words, the fruit of the spirit need to be demonstrated. Now we all have bad days and we all have, you know, we're tired and we need another cup of coffee. But generally people will say, no, this is a person of integrity. What they're talking about, we can actually see demonstrated. And that is attractive to them. In other words, we would like to have that kind of character and that kind of nature. And so not only does the joy, and the Salvation Army in the early days was known for that, our joyful singing, uh, you know, as opposed to somber liturgy. What's attracting people to come in from community? Once they're in, what do they see that holds them in community? And so I do believe, as Wendy said, even in marginalized situations, sometimes we're not allowed to proclaim, but we're always living. And I was very challenged when I read that the, the Quakers, friends, decided during the Vietnamese war that they would send people simply to live in villages, not to do anything else, not to hold meetings, not to read, write statistical reports, do projects, just to live. 
to be a physical expression of God's love and mercy in a world that had been turned upside down by war. And I, I think presence evangelism, as we sometimes title that, uh, can be very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And people are always watching. It might take them a few weeks. It might take them years. These conversations happen organically. They can't be forced. But similarly, when given the opportunity, when somebody says, why do you do that? That's when the spirit says, now it's time to talk. You really have to talk about why you're still here in the midst of COVID or typhoid or cholera or SARS or whatever it happens to be. Why are you still working? Why do you still feel it's important? Because of God's love and reaching out. And uh, we spoke recently on Philippians 2. Again, I feel always challenging uh, for disciples to have the mind of Christ so that we too are prepared to go to suffering humanity. And in the midst of that, I love the end of Philippians. Rejoice. Rejoice always. And again, I say, this is not something that's starchy and stuffy and <laughs> you can have fun. Now, occasionally I know people in my boardroom scratch their head and say, what's the TC talking about today? He seems to be having a great time. <laughs> and this is a really serious topic. <laughs> We can deal with serious topics and get down to brass tacks, but there is a sense of continuous joy and peace in discipleship. I think one of the pieces, and I, I mean, I've, I've read Needham and for many years now, but I, I think one of the things that I am just a thousand percent behind and have enjoyed conversation with him is that as salvationists, we're called to live in the world. Uh, all believers are called to live in the world. Uh, we're not of the world, we recognize that, but we're called to live in the world. And what, what enables us to do that? I have to really believe that Christ by his spirit is living in me so that when I go out that door every morning, <laughs> I'm not going out alone. I, you know, Christ is in me in the world. I think the other thing is the more, the older I get, and I hate that, but hey, the older I get, I've discovered um that God continually says, you want to find me? I'm in the world. You want to see what I'm doing? I'm in the community. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not within your four walls and your roof. <laughs> Ken Sian's comments about the building issue. You really want to know what, what my spirit's doing? Follow me into your street. Follow me to the bakery, to the, to the school ground, to the whatever it is, because that's where you're going to see me. That's where you're going to see me act. Like I'm already working. And I think that's that's the piece that really encourages me. I don't have to go out and say, okay, God, what are you going to do today? Because you wake up in the morning and God says, hey, I've already been at work. Come and see what I've done. Come and see what the Lord has done. That's a huge chorus here in Zambia. Because there is a genuine conviction and belief that God is already at work, seen and unseen. And so, of course, if if we're going out the door, <laughs> um, then we're going to see what God's going to do. And that's the invitation to partner with him. I think it's it's the reminder that the mission isn't ours. The responsibility isn't ours. What we're called to is faithfulness. It's like follow Jesus out the door in the morning. That much I can do. And the rest is, is pretty cool, to be honest, regardless of what you face. And I don't know what you're both facing in, in east and west of Canada with the COVID. But COVID has had a real positive impact. When we started in March to self-isolate and then it became locked down and then we restricted and then churches uh, needed certification and, and health certificates. Uh, there was a phrase that was beginning to be circulated, the church. Mm. And we had to respond to that to say, no, sorry, the, the church is never closed. Um, we are not holding large meetings anymore, but we are the church. We walk into community, the church is always active. And that led to a series of teachings and meetings. And uh, it's exciting now. I, I'll meet soldiers, local officers. As soon as they see me across the shopping mall in their parking lot or whatever, they'll shout, we are the church. <laughs> and we laugh. And then we just continue. Yeah. So I think the positiveness is, is we got out of the building and we had to find new ways. We had to use Zoom and small Bible study groups. And, talk to people one by one on mobile phones. And so the church is never closed. It's always active as long as his disciples and believers are active in the world. I say amen to that.
That's uh, such yeah. a good word, and uh, we appreciate so much those perspectives. They're, they're very, very helpful to us. This is a conversation that uh, has, I believe, been life-giving, uh, been very encouraging, and I thank you both for your input. Unfortunately, we are out of time, and so we do need to uh, draw this conversation to a close, but uh, I'll just say, is there any last things you would like to say to the Canada Bermuda Territory at this point in our history? I, I think I would just simply say, uh, be faithful in your context, whatever that looks like, and don't be afraid to be yourself. That's who God made you to be. Absolutely. Don't be afraid. Awesome. And, and we're praying so for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Don't be afraid. We are the church. That conversation is just as encouraging and exciting as it was the first time. We do again want to say thank you to Colonels Ian and Wendy Swan for their time in advance of tonight's program and for their challenging dialogue with all of us. To close off our evening and send us out into mission in the communities where we live, we'll hand the mic over to Commissioner Tracy to send us off with prayer and out into mission. Well, thank you again tonight for coming and sharing with us. What a great start to our final segment in this series. Uh, a segment Needham refers to as simply the mission. We want to say thank you to our host, our new host, Sheldon and Erica. Thank you. You did a great job tonight. But we would also want to say thank you to our friends and colleagues, as Sheldon already alluded to, Ian and Wendy Swan, for sharing their thoughts around the importance of making disciples from their international experience. The invitation to each one of us tonight is an invitation from Jesus. And Erica already asked the question of the, of the swans and introduced uh, from page 170 in the book that he invites us to live in the world to convincingly as his disciples that some people will want to be like us. Some will even start to act like us until they see Jesus and embrace him as Lord. Well, that is our goal, that the whole world would know Jesus and embrace him as Lord. And before I pray tonight, in case you miss the video, uh, please join us next week as we discuss Chapter 10, Find Our Mission, with panelists from across the territory. There's only three weeks to go, but others are still welcome to join us, and they can join us on salvationist.ca. So let's just pray together before we leave. Father, as your disciples, we want to imitate you. We are all still on a journey of a disciple's life, and we may not have it all figured out at times or feel that we have the skills or the gifts to follow you well. But Father, help us to learn from you, from your word and from each other. Jesus, we want to be good models of a healthy, growing disciple's life. And so Holy Spirit, to continue to empower us to live like you, to live like Jesus as you live in us. And so we want others to follow us as we follow you, Jesus. You invite us as individuals. You invite us as core to live out your mission in our world, in communities that others might discover your love for them and choose to follow Jesus as his disciples as well. And so, Father, tonight our desire is for the people we get to do life with to long for you. And so help us to be bold and courageous as we seek you and as we seek to reflect you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Have a good night, and we will see you next week. Join Territorial Leaders Commissioners Floyd and Tracy Tidd for Together in Mission, December 2nd, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. Atlantic. Week 10 features hosts Erica Azak and Captain Sheldon Bungay, with panelists Lieutenant Johnny Valencia, Major Sherry Russell, and Captain Justin Bledel as they discuss the importance of finding your mission, followed by breakout group conversations. Sign up at salvationist.ca for the Zoom link and a copy of Phil Needham's book, Christ at the Door. Your participation will help us shape the Salvation Army of the future.